Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Live at the Waterhole. We're first up, we're in East Africa in Kenya at the Old Donyo Lodge. My name is Ralph Kirsten and what does the bush hold in store for us today? Well, you'll have to sit back, relax and watch as the animals come down to quench their thirst and cool off. And as per usual, please don't forget that this is a live and interactive experience. So we'd love for you to jump on board with us and send us through your questions and your comments. You can do that by going on the Wild Earth website and registering. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag Wild Earth. What is it that you'd like to see? What would you like to chat about? Whatever it is, wildlife related, send it on through. And a very happy Easter around to all of our global viewers. I hope you have a lovely day and I hope it's a lovely safari viewing day as well. Always lovely to have the elephants here at this particular waterhole. Lovely perspective with this camera very close to the ground looking up at them. You can see off in the distance there a Maasai giraffe just uh, biding its time waiting and seeing when it can come through for a drink. So we can see quite a few clouds around as well, but this is quite usual here in this part of Africa. But that being said, I think it's time we go and have a look what the weather's going to be like across all the different locations. <laughs> So a bit of a mixed bag, but a typical autumn's day across the board. There's a bit of clouds, there's a bit of rain, and there's also a bit of sun. So it bodes well and that it's still nice and warm, and lots of the animals will be coming through for a drink. This is not one of our big tuskers that we have um, generally had coming through here, but he's still a big male. So Janine Masson asking and saying, hello Ralph, happy Easter. I was wondering how often do the animals wearing collars get checked to make sure they're not tight around their necks and they have movability. So there's a couple of things that they will make sure of, uh, Janine, and a happy Easter straight back at you. I hope you have a lovely day. And um, so 
with the elephants, if you look at the elephants and the collars that they put on them, it's very much like a necklace. It's actually not tight at all. So they need to generally check them at least every two years. Um, and this is because of the battery and that's how long it lasts. I think there might be some new technology that they last a bit longer. But um, obviously with those collars on, they're using them to track them. So whenever they track them, they will have a good look at them and make sure that they're not too tight in the likes of um, predators, lions, uh, sometimes even hyenas, leopards also do have collars. With especially leopards and lions, um, they do make them a little bit tighter and cheetah. Um, but obviously it needs to be loose enough that it's not choking them, obviously. So they generally don't do uh, growing individuals. They only normally do adults, so there's not much room for growth after that. Um, and then, you know, every two years at the most, they will definitely check them and change the battery, sometimes even change the collar. Uh, sometimes they even wear through, um, and they'll notice when a um, signal is just staying in one spot, obviously, then they'll go and check either the animal's dead or the collar has come off. And then they'll um, obviously try and relocate the animal and re-collar uh, it. Um, but they do generally keep a very good eye on those collars. Um, and it's also dependent on a lot of the guides. Sometimes they keep monitoring the animals. And if they notice that there's any problems on those collars and getting too tight, they will obviously let the management know. And then they'll get involved, bring the vet in um, and sort it out. They don't want to be um, putting the animals out uh, too often as well because it really does affect their heart especially when it's very hot you run the risk of actually killing the animal um, they they do have cardiac arrest um, so it's quite a tricky thing to do um, and they try not do it uh, regularly as well um, with the likes of leopards as I was saying it needs to be quite tight they're climbing a lot in the trees and so on they don't want to be getting hooked and hang themselves um, so each individual species has a typical way of them actually putting these collars on the animals. Uh, with rhinos, they don't go around their necks, they actually put them around their feet. So it's like an ankle bracelet. Um, and elephants, like I say, nice hanging necklace, uh, not tight at all. Uh, so it doesn't really run the chance of getting too tight. So, and Jive Bunny saying Happy Easter from the UK, Ralph. Thank you for making the time to host us on a holiday. Absolutely. I wouldn't be anywhere else except watching the waterholes. Lovely to spend my day doing this. As that elephant now has sauntered off, it seems like uh, he's given the giraffe a chance, but uh, we'll have to see if he makes his way through. So now that there's a little bit less activity here, I think we'll give it a bit of a chance to fill up once more. And the vehicle's come in, so let's head to Stony Point. And wonderful. We've got some African penguins out on the rocks, just uh, probably sunning themselves, warming up. Beautiful day down in this part of South Africa. Lovely hot day down in Cape Town, and I'm pretty sure that the southeaster will be blowing. I don't think it's gotten up just yet, but uh, as the day progresses, pretty sure it's going to start blowing. And as I've said that, it seems the wind has picked up, and those little wobbles on the camera is uh, from the Cape Doctor.
Why do they call it the Cape Doctor? Because it's so strong that it blows literally everything away. And Victor was saying, loving this scene, it's uh, always nice to listen to the ocean. And what a bonus to be able to watch these African penguins as well now. They're not too active. They've probably been out fishing this morning nice and early and then enjoying the middle part of the day, sunning themselves. So they'll go back for another fish a little bit later on. And Ron was asking, what do penguins eat? Ron, it's um, mostly fish, so pilchards, sardines, um, but they will also eat uh, calamari, uh, squid, and and the likes. So, but the majority of the fish, and the smaller ones, being those anchovies and pilchards. And of course, penguins are also monogamous, so they'll stick in their little pairs for life. And so I would, um, I would think that these, this 
couples. Yeah, on the rocks. So Starbuck was asking, and uh, lovely to have you on board once again, uh, saying, hi Ralph, do penguins drink? Well, the short answer is yes, but it's uh, obviously, how do they drink um, being in such a salty environment? So they actually have a supraorbital gland, which is located just uh, above their eye. And this filters salt from their bloodstream, which is then excreted through the bill. Um, which is uh, either done, it either just drips out or they sneeze it out. But this doesn't mean that they chug seawater, to, you know, um, constantly to drink the, to drink uh, and to quench their thirst. They will also drink fresh water, which collects in, in the rocks um, from rain. But mostly, uh, you know, they will obviously take in the seawater and then excrete that salt out of their bills. So they are able to actually drink. And one of the animals that are able to drink seawater and their bodies are evolved to excrete the salt. A lot of, a lot of the Arctic and, and sub-Antarctic uh, penguins and Antarctic penguins, they will um, also eat snow and ice um, and, and obviously get their water in that way. Um, but have the same means of excreting the salt. So Soul Shatter PWI saying whenever I hear the ocean and bird song, I'm always reminded of the health benefits of being exposed to the sounds of nature. It is very peaceful, very calming, and I think uh, very healthy as well. So I must agree with you, Soul Shatter. It's kind of like um, watching a fire, the bush television as we like to call it, and the sounds of that as well. And I was actually involved, or you know, shortly with, with a movie maker, and he said that during the COVID period, um, when he didn't have much else going on, so he started videoing fires, different fires in different um, sort of uh, landscapes, and, and just playing it. And he said it, um, and, and streaming it. And he said he, he landed up having a lot of subscribers uh, just enjoying these fires in different locations and different settings and I think very similar to the likes of the ocean as well. I must say there are also a couple of birds that I would rather not hear all the time, the likes of uh, hardy dar ibis at particular times of the day, as well as um, Natal and red bull spurfowls, who are generally up before any of the other birds, and they're like the bush chickens. But when they're squawking at 3 or 4 in the morning, they can be quite irritating, especially when it's right next to your tent. But I suppose it's a small price to pay for the other wonderful sounds of, the, of nature. And Catherine was saying, need to plan a visit to the penguins again. I love them. Yeah, I did too. It's always nice to see them, especially in person. But lucky you if you get to go and see them.
So Canine Girl asking, great to be with you as always, Ralph. Do penguins use echolocation like whales and dolphins? That's a very interesting question, Canine Girl. Um, the penguins are the champions of diving in the bird world. And on a single breath of air, um, the likes of emperor penguins, uh, you know, obviously African penguins, a little bit different, but they can dive as deep as 565 meters and remain underwater for as long as 28 to 50 minutes. An average dive and diving session lasts about six minutes in the search of myctophids, which is lanternfish, deep sea small fishes, and it's an absolute record amongst birds. But it is believed that once in the dark, deep water, penguins use echolocation just like dolphins. The secret is a special hypersensitive type of hemoglobin which is interesting because I never knew anything about that. And as an adaptation for swimming, penguins actually lack pneumatic bones. They're, they are also known to swallow stones, which helps them both for digestion and also like a weight belt for diving.
Now it's quite interesting that um, pretty much the, the predators for penguins would uh, be great white sharks. And I think they're probably a little bit more relaxed nowadays because um, a lot of South Africans may know the story about port and starboard, the two orcas that have been uh, marauding uh, around the, uh, quite a big stretch of the South African coastline. And there was a report on CNN by Katie um, Hunt who just recently who spoke of a pair of orcas working in concert have been killing great whites along a stretch of South African coastline since at least 2017, plundering the sharks' nutrient-rich livers and discarding the rest. And we're pretty sure that they moved down uh, the east coast because we had a lot of dolphins watch, washing up the beach um, in the Port Alfred Kenton area and it was obvious that uh, it was orcas and, it, and that they were also only eating the liver as well. Scientists have been trying to make sense of the hunting approach, which has driven a lot of the sharks away from some parts of the coast around Cape Town. And now research has revealed a startling new twist in the behavior that could offer clues on what it might mean for the wider marine ecosystem. And scientists witnessed one of the hunters, a male orca known as Starboard, single-handedly kill a two and a half meter juvenile white shark within a two minute time frame last year. Over two decades of annual visits to South Africa, I've observed the profound impact these killer whales have on the local white shark population. Seeing starboard carrier white shark's liver past our vessel is unforgettable, said Dr. Primo Micarelli, who's a marine biologist at Italy's Shark Studies Center and the University of Siena, who was aboard one of the two vessels from which researchers observed the attack. Despite my awe for these predators, I'm increasingly um, concerned about the coastal marine ecology balance, says Meccarelli. It's not unprecedented for orcas, highly intelligent and social animals, to hunt large animals individually. However, it's the first such occurrence involving what is one of the world's largest predators, the great white shark. The research is reported in a study published um, in the African Journal of Marine Science. And starboard's kill is at odds with more widely observed cooperative hunting behavior among orcas, which can surround large prey such as sea lions, seals, and sharks, and use their combined intelligence and strength to attack. Previously observed attacks on great whites involved between two and six orcas and took up to two hours, according to their study. And this sighting revealed evidence of solitary hunting by at least one killer whale, challenging conventional cooperative hunting behaviors known in the region. So these are groundbreaking insights into the predatory behavior of the species. The event detailed in the study took place on June 18, 2023, 800 meters offshore, close to Steel Island near Mossel Bay, about 400 kilometers east of Cape Town and where we are in this area, where people on two vessels were observing the orcas. Less than an hour after arriving, a shark appeared near the surface and researchers, tourists and other, others on board witnessed starboard grip the left pectoral fin of a shark and thrust forward with the shark several times before eventually eviscerating it in less than two minutes. Later, starboard was photographed from one of the vessels with a bloody piece of peach-colored liver in its mouth. And Starboard's male companion, Port, was observed around 100 meters away while the kill took place and didn't get involved. So the duo is well known among the study's authors and has been involved in hunting and killing great white sharks for many years. The walkers' dorsal fins are bent in opposite directions, the inspiration for their names. And the two travel huge distances along South Africa's eastern coastline up as far as Namibia. I'm not sure how they can go up the eastern coastline to Namibia, but uh, yeah, they'd have to go all the way through the Suez Canal. Um, anyway, I think maybe that's on the western side, otherwise it's up to Mozambique. But we know that they've been on the, on the eastern seaboard. But it wasn't until 2022 that aerial footage first captured the orcas killing a great white shark. And while we don't have solid evidence on the specific drivers, the arrival of the killer whale pair could be linked to broader changes in the ecosystem. And it's clear that human activities, such as climate change and industrial fishing, are stressing the oceans. And to fully grasp the dynamics, there's uh, obviously a lot of additional research um, that needs to be done. But there's still plenty of unanswered questions about these shark hunting killer whales and where they came from. And they're scaring off great white shark populations 
and they a lot of them heading up into the trans sky area and some also heading well away all the way over to australia and as they relocate they might end up overlapping with heavy commercial fisheries so that's where the problem lies the distinct smell of shark liver in the air and gulls diving towards a slick on the water's surface as well as a second shark carcass measuring three and a half meters discovered nearby led onlookers to believe another great white might have been killed before the boat's arrival that day. So the kill by a lone orca might have been made possible by the prey's smaller size as a juvenile great white, according to the study. The adult great whites have a maximum length of six and a half meters and a mass of two and a half tons. But the swift swiftness of the attack may reflect Starbo's skill and efficiency as a predator, which could be a response to the stress of spending time hunting close to shorelines in areas where humans are abundant. We cannot speculate that this killer whale has become more sophisticated, but the rapid time frame he killed the shark in does show incredible skill and proficiency. This is uh, interesting stuff. But the livers of great whites are huge organs, and it's about a third of their body mass and rich in lipids. And the orcas discard the rest of the carcass. Selective feeding behavior that's known amongst other carnivores, such as harbor seals, brown bears, and wolves. We could even say the likes of caracal as well. And they get into the belly and just go for the kidneys, the liver, the heart and the lungs. But as smart top predators, killer whales can rapidly learn new hunting techniques on their own or from others. So monitoring and understanding the behaviors used here by other killer whales in South Africa is an important part of helping us understand more about these animals. Uh, a lot happens out in the ocean that we're not really aware of and it's lovely that these researchers are um, doing that wonderful work and uh, bringing that work home. So Aaron was asking how many penguin species exist and Aaron I do believe that it's um, 18. The M2 penguin, the emperor penguin, macaroni penguin, chin strap, a deli, the king penguin, southern rockhopper penguin, little penguin, royal penguin, the Magellanic or Ma yes Magellanic penguin, the the Ordland penguin, the African penguin that we're looking at here, the Humboldt penguin, the Galapagos penguin, yellow-eyed penguin, and then there's a couple with uh, very long scientific names, er Eretiscus tonii and Aprosdocotus microtero, something like that. Um, but we obviously don't have all that diversity, we've only got the African penguin. So Eddie was asking, how do they protect their eggs? So they sort of stand near to them. Um, they make a nest just on the beach. And if you go into this area of Cape Town, you can actually go down and see the, the, the penguins when they are nesting. Um, from a boardwalk, you used to be able to go down to them. But for obvious uh, conservation reasons, um, they've sort of protected it now. And you're not allowed to just go down on the beach. Um, my brother actually got married on the beach. and. Um, they were barefoot and in in their baggies it was a very informal wedding and in the background there were some penguins so they were the best dressed and formally dressed at my booty's wedding so that was lovely but to protect their eggs 
they they sort of just uh, stand near to it and it's just uh, you know left open especially if one of them normally stays and uh, protects the eggs so they sometimes even balance them on their feet and then they sort of um, squat downwards and, and just get their feathers over the over the eggs themselves. And I would say that because where the African penguins um, live and survive, um, you know, it can be quite cold, but it can also be very baking hot on the beaches. So I think very often they're, they're not actually uh, sort of incubating the eggs and trying to keep them warm. They're actually trying to keep them cool from the elements and the sun because they could probably literally cook inside their shells. So. I think it's um, actually protection more so from the sun here in these parts than from the cold with a lot of the other penguins having to warm their eggs up. A little bit of movement, just changing of place, getting a bit more comfortable on the rock there, I think. So a nice bit of uh, different birding that we've had here and a little crab making its way across the sand there. But stick with this theme and we're going to change of place but um, we're going to change from seabirds to freshwater birds and let's go to Kamferstam. Just outside of Kimberley and this wonderful 400 hectare reserve for the protection mainly of the lesser and greater flamingos and a lovely nesting site for them as well. It's nice to see them out and about. Some are just catching a bit of a snooze though, all standing on one leg. As we know, that's a more efficient way of standing in the case of a lot of birds. And particularly with the flamingos where they can actually lock that joint in and standing on one leg takes less energy than standing on two. 
as well as them having less exposed uh, to the elements and they can keep the other leg warm so that's another benefit Now, I think that's a black wing stilt, but it looked like he had a bit of a limp. Not sure what's going on there. We'll keep an eye on him. A nice little overview of the area and of the waterhole itself. Looking out across the Kampfer's Dam. Thank you. 
So just um, from BirdLife South Africa, which is one of my go-to websites um, with regards to anything birding, um, and this here at Kampfersdam, it's what's called an IBA, and they are important bird and biodiversity areas and sites of global significance for bird conservation. Um, and identified nationally through multi-stakeholder processes using globally standardized and quantitative methods. So here at Kampfersdam, which is located six kilometers north of Kimberley in the Ecotone, where three major biomes, the Kalahari savanna, grassland and the Namakuru meet. The dam is natural in origin as it forms part of the central South African pan system known as the Highfelt Salt Pans. And it's an ephemeral, which is non-perennial, endorheic pan of 500 hectares in extent, receiving water from its 162 kilometer squared catchment, 30 to 40 megaliters of partially treated sewage effluent from Kimberley per day, and half of the town's stormwater runoff. Over the past 15 years, it's been transformed from an ephemeral pan to a permanent wetland due to a steady increase in sewage effluent inflow. And the area around the pan is relatively flat, holding red, yellow, freely drained soils and areas of calcrete that cover the upper slopes and flats on the northern and northwestern shore. Vegetation types present in addition to high fault salt pan are Kimberley thorn felt and foul boss rocky shrub felt. The water's edge on the pan's southern shore is dominated by common reed, the Phragmites australis. The partially treated sewage effluent has caused the ecosystem to become eutrophic and rich in phosphates and other minerals, resulting in the establishment of extensive reed beds and sedges. And the water body's alkalinity has increased significantly. The sewage also promotes the growth of up to 26 species of phytoplankton, or algae, in the dam, of which the blue-green algae, uh, Atherospira fusiformis and diatomes, Cyclotella species, are usually the most abundant. As a consequence, this IBA supports large numbers of water birds, and in such dynamic aquatic ecosystems, water bird species and numbers change with fluctuating water quality and water levels. Most of the terrestrial habitats remain in a natural state with some transformation due to two railway lines, roads, farm buildings and a farm dam, sewerage works, an ash dump and eroded areas. But this RBA provides a reliable refuge for water birds in a semi-arid area where wetlands are scarce. Comfort's Dam regularly holds more than 20,000 birds. Special feature is the large, large numbers of greater flamingos and lesser flamingos that are found here throughout the year. And this RBA supports probably the largest permanent population of le lesser flamingos in Southern Africa. At least 63 water birds species have been recorded here and 243 species have been reported uh, during uh, one of their censuses. And the most abundant water birds in recent years are the lesser flamingo. The greater flamingo and the grey-headed gulls. The highest number of water birds counters counted was 84,919 individuals. In 2006. Of these, 81,664 were lesser flamingos. Jeepers, I wonder how difficult that must have been to be counting them and you don't count the same one again. That would be a difficult count, I would say. And the African marsh harrier and the chestnut banded plover also occur here. The dam also occasionally holds large numbers of black-necked grebes and South African shell ducks. But there's IBA trigger species, which um, there's globally threatened birds are the lesser flamingo and the chestnut banded plover. Regionally threatened birds are the greater flamingo. Biome restricted birds are the birchal sand grass, uh, Kalahari scrub robin, and the sociable weaver. Congregatory species are black necked grebes, South African shell ducks, and Egyptian geese. One protected endemic plant species, the Titonopsis calcarea, is present here. And the most significant threats to Comfort's Dam are poor water quality and flooding. Water levels reached devastating proportions in 2010, causing millions of rands of damage to two rail violation of the flamingo breeding in Ireland and the loss of potential ecotourism income.
Unacceptably high levels of nitrates and phosphate, untreated or poorly treated effluent make the water eutrophic, resulting in toxic algal blooms. And the high concentrations of Escherichia coli and fecal coliforms in the water pose a significant health risk to potential water users. So I think this is probably the biggest threat to this water hole is just too much untreated uh, sewage effluent. So here we've got lesser and greater flamingos. The greater just being bigger than the lesser. There's mostly greaters here though. Uh, there's red knobbed coots that are swimming around. There's probably a couple of moor hens in between them as well. So Jack Sultan saying what a bird haven it is absolutely sometimes we have a lot more here um, it's a little bit sparse today but uh, it still is a real bird haven indeed and then Jilly B saying hi Ralph happy Easter to you and straight back at you Jilly B is there a reason flamingos all seem to roost with their heads to the right is this an anatomical adaptation and I, you know, from the research that I have done, Jilly B, it seems that um, it's like with humans, um, mainly, I, I think this is true, that most people are right-handed um, and less being left-handed. So you will see most of the flamingos going to the right, but there are some that will go to the left. So I think it's just a preference from the individual birds themselves. But I'll do a bit of digging and see if there's anything more to it. So and Danny was asking why are the birds on one side of the dam. I think it's uh, got a lot to do with this very shallow section here. It might be a lot deeper on the other side of the dam. So I think here it's nice and easy for them to walk and forage and feed. And so I think that's why they prefer this side. And it, it seems to go across the board with all the birds. They can nest, they can feed, and they can also you know, get away from the shore a bit. Um, and it does keep them safe from predators to a degree. I'll definitely hear them coming and it won't be as easy for them to get to them uh, without them knowing.
So an ant was asking, is that the sound of flamingos? Sounds kind of like frogs. It does a bit, doesn't it? It's quite squawky, uh, and it is a bit squawky croak, if I can put it like that. A lot of the herons and the cranes and the flamingos sound quite similar in, in the squawky calls. There's a bit of a better close-up. You see this great bit in more detail. So Jack Salton saying we have quite a bird haven down here in the Florida Keys where I used to fish for many years. It was also a sanctuary for so many birds during springtime as they flew south to avoid the cold air. And so very lucky to have this resource too and visit and enjoy the wild. Yep, very lucky. I, uh, it's one of the places I would love to go is the Florida Keys. So good on you, Jack Salton. So Taylor was asking, how do you establish whether a bird is a male or a female? Uh, Taylor, it will always depend on the different species of birds. So and if you get a bird identification book, it normally details the differences between the males and the females, as well as the adults and the immatures. But when it comes to flamingos, there's no real difference in their color or plumage. Um, the males are just normally uh, taller than the females. Um, but other than that, it's quite difficult to tell between them. Generally, um, with other species, you know, the, the males will have very extravagant uh, breeding plumage and, and can even sometimes change their skin color. Sometimes they get um, these lappets uh, or, um, you know, different body parts even sort of come through during the breeding plumage. Um, and the females generally, you know, because they're not showing off like the males do to attract the mate, they're the ones obviously looking for the mate and looking for the most uh, elaborate sort of looking males, uh, dependent on the species. Uh, so they, they're generally not as um, colorful, I would say, as the males. When you go to birds of prey, sometimes uh, very common that the females are actually males. Um, so yes it always depends on which particular species you're speaking of um, and they will have the differences if you look at the likes of the paradise widar with its massive long tail that it only gets in the breeding plumage and the female 
She's a tiny little brown bird that looks very similar to a female weaver, for instance. So very elaborate and totally different looking uh, birds of the same species. And if you didn't know that that was a male, you would never say that they, uh, you know, and that's a female, that they're part of the same species because they look entirely different. So Sandy Franklin, 69, asking, good morning, afternoon, Ralph, which bird is the best mating ritual? Um, the one that comes immediately to mind, and I think it would for most people, is a peacock. Um, I think it's probably got one of the most amazing uh, mating rituals. But, I mean, flamingos also have a very interesting one, the way that they all sort of um, foul past each other and their heads go up and then they put them down. Um, very interesting to watch as well uh, and it's almost like a community mating ritual that they all do together um, as a collective but there's there's obviously lots of others i like to see the little black back puff back how he puffs his back up to look like a snowball and that's where the afrikaans name comes from sneeuw baleki um, but uh, just looking online and there's there's obviously you know just to get ideas if you think of bald eagles and a lot of eagles do this um when they lock their talons and they they sort of spin around in a courtship embrace um during you know with a very dramatic aerial display so i think that's another one um there's a male and this this obviously isn't in south africa or africa it's uh, called a male red capped mannequin uh, does a moonwalk dance on the branch to try and uh, attempt uh, to woo the female and a male warns parotia bird of paradise performs a ballerina display so i think there's a lot of birds of paradise that are also very very interesting um, 
But mating rituals for me are very interesting across the board. And it's crazy with some of the birds, especially the tropical species, and uh, the amount of energy that goes into it. Another one that I've just thought of is obviously the ostrich uh, with the males uh, performing an elaborate dance um, sort of, and swinging their heads from side to side and it's pretty much one of the reasons why they still maintain feathers as well and they, when they go into breeding plumage they get these very pink shins as well as a pink bill so they change completely too. But I've been privileged to watch this on a number of occasions, um, most recently at the Kariche Game Reserve, and I was um, there. Then I'm sure that some of you may have seen it on um, National Geographic. Uh, they have done a, a few sort of documentaries on, on birds uh, mating rituals. And there's one that is spectacular with the western grebes that walk on water during their courtship dance. That's another one. And Cecile saying the Cory Busted males display is also unique. Absolutely. And if you've ever seen this, you'll never forget it. Uh, I've seen it in the Etosha National Park. Um, and the sound that they make as well. So they sort of fill up this air, uh, the sack on, on, on their necks. And then they, they kind of um, scrunch it like a concertina. And they do this kind of call as they do that. Um, and it's obviously expanded as well. They almost look like a frog when they do this. Um, but very interesting and amazing to see. Now here's another interesting one, the bower bird, which are generally aren't the showiest of birds, uh, but they don't have elaborate plumage or coloring. So instead the male constructs a structure entirely for the pleasure of the females. And there are certainly species where the male constructs a nest, but the bower is just a place for the male to show off. So once it's built, the male uses anything from shells to dead beetles to leaves to decorate. Some even gravitate to certain colors, going as far as painting their bowers with berries. And the competition with bower birds is far from clean, and the males often fight and sabotage each other's bowers and steal their ornaments. But when everything is arranged just so, the male sings, and if a female comes, they'll dance and mate. So, but that, however, is the extent of the romance, though. Once they're finished, the female leaves, and the male begins a and attempts to attract another mate to his um, sort of shrine that he's built in the forest.
So, nice question coming from Jack Sultan, uh, asking how far do flamingos travel in their migrations? So, it's quite interesting because um, flamingos, when they do migrate, they do so mainly at night. And they also prefer to fly with cloudless skies and favorable tailwinds. They can travel approximately 600 kilometers in one night at about 50 to 60 kilometers an hour. Um, but there we just had a frozen screen. So we've changed of place and we've headed up into one of my favorite places in the world. And that's in the Tosha National Park at Okokuyu. So just finishing off with that question for Jack Sultan. Um, flamingos will migrate all over Southern Africa and, and they go to sort of specific pans to breed, such as the Makhadi Khadi pan. Uh, obviously, there at Kamfors Dam. Um, there's also in Itosha, the Itosha pan. And they also come here. Um, and, you know, obviously, Kamfors Dam, and there's some places down in the Western Cape as well. Um, but during the non-breeding season, so that, that you know they 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 do migrate to breed and congregate for the breeding season, uh, but outside of that, the movement is very dispersed and nomadic, um, and also just sort of spread out amongst this network of wetlands around the subcontinent. Sometimes they can even go to Susus Flay, which is uh, smack bang in the middle of the desert. Um, but I don't think that they breed there. I've never seen any evidence of that or read anything as such. I think they just might use it when it does fill up um, for, for feeding as a, as a bit of a stopover on, on their way either north or south um, between these different wetland systems. So nice and quiet here today, and if anybody's uh, not aware, this is the time of the year, which is the rainy season, uh, in Namibia and in the desert itself, in the Namib. So seeing those clouds there in the background, this is not what you would see generally throughout the year. This is just now in the rainy season, which is what we're in, um, and generally lasting till about April or so. Um, and then as you go into winter, there's no more rain until next uh, well, until the next October, November period is when Namibia has what we call the small rains. And then January to, you know, the end of March, April or so are the big rains. Um, so when this occurs, the animals disperse and they're not concentrated around the water holes. So you might think it's quiet here now, but give it a few months and it's going to be jam packed with animals once more. So and also if you're thinking of going and traveling to Itosha, um, it's it's very good to bear these uh, rain rain periods or rainy seasons in mind because it's really going to change your safari experience. If you're a birder, obviously now is the best time to be in Namibia um, because you've got all the migratory birds. Uh, it's a little bit late now, but uh, you know you could come in the rainy season for all the special birds that you get in Namibia. Um, but if it's for purely a safari experience and seeing a lot of the animals, you want to go in the, the dry periods. The drier, the better. So any time until it, the later, the better, because the drier it will be. Um, but generally, you would say August, September, probably the best time. Um, but if it doesn't rain and you go a little bit later, October can be excellent and even into November as well. And then the, once the rains start coming, um, yeah, as I say, it's not as good, this, the, the game viewing, as it would be during the dry season. So and in the wet season, you generally don't get elephants here. Uh, you might have the odd bull or so, but uh, the the rain sort of comes in from the east uh, and then moves across the Itosha National Park. So when the you know the elephants and the, I think the giraffes even follow them as well, um, they pick up that the rain is coming 
you know, at the end of the dry season. So they all sort of migrate across onto the eastern side of the reserve. So it would be better uh, game viewing on the eastern side of the reserve currently, but still uh, the animals are well dispersed, not all concentrated next to the water holes, uh, but the elephants generally on that side regardless. And then as it starts drying up, then they start moving back onto the western side and into this area of the park. Right, so it is rather quiet here, so I don't think we'll stick around any longer. Let's change of place and let's go back to Kenya and Old Donio. Now we've got some beautiful Maasai giraffe. Look at this one in the middle, looking fabulous. Lovely coat on, I think it's a female. She just looks very clean. The white is very light and her spots are very dark. So it's making, it's not a female, it's a bull. That's it. Get in for a drink. I've been joined by lots of those uh, hitchhiking red bull ox pickers. So Bill the Bull saying thanks Ralph for all this cool info you share about these locations. You're very welcome, Bill. And uh, lovely to have you on board once again. And something that I wanted to mention about the giraffe here, because some of the viewers, you may re remember that we saw on one of the highlights, um, the elephant attacked a giraffe, the elephant bull that came in. It was um, during the night. And then the giraffe was drinking and the elephant bull was in must, so very irrational state of mind and just attacked the giraffe for no reason with its tusk and lifted the giraffe up and pierced it and um, it obviously then went off and died. Um, but I think the ease at which the elephant sort of went through the skin, look obviously it was still a, a huge push with the, with the tusk. But I think a lot had to do with the tightness of the giraffe's skin. Because we must remember they've got an extremely high blood pressure. And so they counteract this with having a tight skin, particularly around the legs. But I'm also pretty sure that it's, you know, across the whole body in general as well. And so I know from having two dogs, two different dogs, uh, uh, breeds, one being a... Uh, Rhodesian Ridgeback and the other one being a Basset Hound. The Basset Hound got very loose skin and when he's been bitten by the dogs, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, compensates or it doesn't uh, tear the skin very easily. Yes, you get punctured, but you don't get torn or anything. And the Ridgeback had a much tighter skin, not very loose, and it always got injuries very badly. So I think the same case could be said for the giraffe and that it got pierced so easily like that with a lot to do with the very tight skin that they have.
a reasonably young giraffe, I think, this bull, with this beautiful coloration on him. There's a nice close-up of uh, those hitchhiking red-billed oxpeckers on the giraffe. So African Sunset was asking, do giraffe have the highest tick burden and can they die from severe infestation? So just to answer that, you know, body size of the animal um, as well as the habitat where, where they are are real big uh, determinants of tick infestations um, I wouldn't say that a healthy giraffe will really you know have a problem from from big infestations it's only when the uh, condition is not good when the condition drops normally as a result of uh, poor resources water and food then they they become susceptible to diseases and from big infestations of ticks. Giraffe probably do in these kind of habitats, um, you know, have the, the the highest tick burdens because of their size and also the amount of hair. Uh, elephants do get them, but they their skin is thicker, um, so it's more difficult for them to attach, and they don't have as much hair as well, so they don't get as many. Um, as giraffe. Giraffe can have a few thousand um, ticks on them at any given time. So lots and lots of food for those oxpeckers and you can see how abundant the oxpeckers are as well. I think you probably got like one family of oxpeckers per giraffe. Um, there's lots of them. So yes it is interesting and you must remember that there's many species of ticks as well. I think on one study they found up to eight uh, 28 different species of ticks on individual animals so yeah it's not always the same species um, and they also have different uh, life cycles some are, are two-stage life cycles some are three-stage life cycle i.e. they they've got the larva um, and, and that then uh, goes into the adult and then gets even bigger after that um, and, you know, either twi two or three changes that they have or phases in the life cycle of the ticks themselves. So they'll, uh, in one phase, they'll get up and onto, onto uh, an animal, um, get into the blood, feed, and then drop off, and then metamorphosize into the next phase, and then hang around normally on some grass and put their little legs out. And as an animal walks past, wee, off they go. They take uh, the ride um, as they go along, or when they're standing still, they cr crawl up their legs. But you normally walk through these nests of them, and then that's when they get onto you, um, onto the hair, which is what they latch onto. Uh, and then they crawl up and get into the nice soft areas, latch on, get their food, drop off, and then go into the next phase. So two and three stage or phases uh, in the life cycles of the different um, species of ticks.
Canine Girl was asking, could there be a slight leucism in this giraffe? Maybe that one that we were looking at. But it actually had quite dark uh, spots. I think it was just very contrasting. Maybe a little bit of that. There's definitely some kind of difference in the coloration that we were seeing there. Um, it just made it look quite different. So Jilly B saying, I do feel sorry for the giraffe constantly twitching to be rid of the ox peckers. Definitely, I think it can be quite irritating. On the plus side though, that bit of irritation does help in alleviate some of the um, ticks that are present. But I've also seen some research that, that does suggest that even though you know these ox peckers are very present and very active in feeding on the giraffes it doesn't really have a huge impact on the population of ticks on the giraffe at any given time is that a i think that was a brown snake eagle that just flew off And Picasso was um, asking and saying, Happy Easter Sunday, Ralph. Straight back at you, Picasso. Have a lovely day. Uh, do all the rains this season in Kenya influence the migration in any way? Yes, it will, obviously. Um, you know, it obviously makes the rivers surge, and so it makes it difficult for the, or, or more difficult for the crossings. Um, and it seems the the research suggests that it's a el nino rain so higher or above average rainfall and that that will generally lead to you know especially there's a lot of farming that goes on and around kenya there'll be a lot of erosion uh, and surface runoff um, but in terms of the migration itself uh, it, it, it's, it, it obviously drives the animals to to move in in the different directions where the rain has come and where the food will be um, but it, it does make an impact with those rivers so there will be a lot more fatalities the higher the river is um, for the crossings so yes i would say it does have quite a significant impact on the migration when you have these above average rainfall So gone a bit quiet now and so I think we'll move off. Let's change of country completely. Let's head back to South Africa but this time into the northwest province and Madikwe. Lovely nice view of a waterbuck bull and a couple of blacksmith lapwings. Nice and lush here for the water buck to feed on this grass in the middle of the water hole. The elephants also like it.
there comes a couple in Parlour, also coming in to try and get a drink. Seems uh, this water hole is driving, drying up quite significantly, so it does make it a little bit more difficult for them to access the water. I'm sure they'll come right. They do run the risk of when they go into that mud of getting stuck, because uh, with those hooves of theirs, it uh, really cuts into the mud. And then they've got that suction that is created, and so it can quite easily get stuck in there. So I hope none do today. So Sandy Franklin asking how long did it take you to learn all of this? Sandy Franklin, I'm still learning, that's for sure, but um, yeah, pretty much my entire professional career, which uh, started just after 1998, um, but before that I was uh, spending countless hours out on the boat, fishing, camping, um, you know, always out in the bush. But uh, my preference was, and the driver behind it was uh, literally fishing. Um, so that's what got me started. I wanted to be a professional fisherman, but uh, my parents were having none of it, so they sent me to study. And when I was 16, I already decided that I was going to study wildlife management. Um, but then I was told by a few guys that were, you know, already in the industry that I should rather go to a technical um, or Technicon, as we call them in South Africa, a technical university, because um, we get a, you get a lot of the practical part included in the course, um, and so you can hit the ground running. As soon as you qualify, you can immediately go out and, you know, get stuck in, um, as opposed to university, where most of it is just theory, and then they still need to train the guys when they come out after they've uh, qualified in university. And so, for the Technicon, we got to do first-hand and while we were studying, a lot of things like um, game counts, uh, fencing, uh, water point management, uh, fires and controlled burnings. Um, you know, and the game counts were all obviously fascinating because we did a few different methods. We did block grids, we did driving. Uh, unfortunately, I never got to do it from the sky, but uh, we also did that while we were on the ground. There were guys counting from up in the sky, etc., and then applying those in statistical formulas according to the different techniques of uh, or whichever technique was chosen uh, in the game count process uh, will require different statistical analysis. So, you know, to get your averages, etc. Um, so it's obviously never perfect, uh, but different techniques do uh, sort of bring better results. Yeah, and then and then to the different species of animals and carrying capacities and environmental impact assessments and uh, plant surveys, soil surveys. You know, all of this we did uh, firsthand uh, in different game reserves across South Africa. Uh, marine conservation as well. We did that down in St Lucia and the Isimangaliso Wetland Park. Uh, we also went into the Kruger, you know, so we were, we were very involved in all of these things. And then obviously having done it and experienced it and been involved, um, you know, I knew this, uh, how to do it. Once I landed up being a, a reserve manager um, and then also moving on to guiding and training of guides eventually. Um, but I must say, that probably the, the most exciting part of my career has been the sort of 4x4 four four camping safaris that I did up in the northwestern part of Namibia um, and trekking and tracking the desert elephants. That coupled with uh, training of guides, I think, are the two sort of that I really enjoyed the most. Lovely seen this. Lots of stripes and the odd impala. This makes for amazing photographs.
if you were there with a nice telescopic lens. A nice mix of animals here. You see that one impala ram, he's lost the tip of his horn. Probably fighting with another ram. I like that. So cheetahs and other animals saying so many barcodes and that being the strikes, stripes on the zebra. Yeah. QR codes, barcodes, definitely. And obviously the more animals that aren't, the sort of safer they feel. Safety in numbers, they've got less chance of being eaten and lots more eyes and ears to keep a lookout for predators. Oh, and there's a blue wildebeest a bull just lying up in the background. We've seen him there quite regularly. I think it's the same one. They are territorial, so that's obviously his spot. And Sandy Franklin 69 was asking what affects the numbers of snakes? I've only seen a couple of them. So Sandy Franklin, um, it's, you know, not so much that uh, affects the numbers of snakes. Um, you know, if there's lots of food, i.e. Uh, lots of amphibians, frogs and rodents, this generally makes up a lot of snakes' diets, um, but obviously depends on the different species. Uh, however, 
it, it, it depends with them being ectothermic on the temperatures. So when it gets hot, very hot, you see lots of snakes. It's incredible. They almost appear out of nowhere. It's the same with the tortoises. Suddenly on a hot day, they're everywhere. And then as it cools down, they just literally disappear. So going up and, and just finding themselves um, a nice uh, comfortable spot out of the way, and nice and hidden, and, um, and then uh, waiting for those hot times again. So I think mainly down to the temperature, specifically because they're ectothermic. But then where there's lots of food for them as well. So we like in the bush camps that we stayed in, particularly the wash area, uh, where there was lots of water around, generally attracted a lot of frogs. Um, and we immediately saw, as soon as there were frogs, there were snakes. So we had to get the guys to make sure that they always moved and, and tried to not have any standing water lying around on the ground, um, as well as when there were any frogs to move them away, um, that they weren't in that area because it would then attract the, the snakes. And then in the kitchen, we, we needed to make it rodent proof so that we didn't attract any mice and rats. Um, because that was another area that we used to find the snakes coming in for the food. So get rid of the food, you get rid of the snakes. And, and, and that obviously goes for food standing around and waste. That then attracts the rodents and, and the rodents then attract the snakes. So Angela Beaver asking, uh, is this all the same species of zebra? Yep, it is the Equius quacha birchelli. So this is the birchels or plains zebra. It's one of the most common. Um, and you will see across southern Africa. Um, and you'll also see them in the migrations in Kenya as well. In southern Africa, we get two more, uh, the mountain zebras. So it's the Hartman's Mountain Zebra that's found in Namibia and the Cape Mountain Zebra which is found in the Cape region of South Africa. Um, so they're more of the smaller species and they're more desert adapted species as well, the mountain zebras. The Birchall Zebra is more of a generalist, so it can live in a, an array of different habitats, much like Impala. So those two are quite similar in their survival strategies and as a result you find them you know in many different habitats and they're able to adapt very well so as long as there's lots of uh, grazing for the zebras and lots of mixed um, uh, feed for the impala they do very well So old punkster saying, is that water clean? It doesn't look clean. It looks very muddy. Uh, I wouldn't say it's very clean at all, old punkster. Um, you know, you, you often see the, even the elephants urinating and, and pooping in the same water that they're busy drinking. So yes, it's not very clean. It's very muddy. It's probably got lots of dung in it as well. Um, look, I mean, the predators don't don't really go and uh, defecate in the water. So it's mainly herb herbivorous um, poop. Uh, so it's, it's not, it doesn't really carry the pathogens that you might find in meat eaters. Um, but it's not making the water any cleaner. Um, but that being said, you know, the animals here are very well adapted to drinking this uh, seemingly dirty water as well. They've got lots of um, uh, acidic uh, stomachs which kills the bacteria that they may be ingesting um, so and they've also adapted to a specific area so I know for having traveled and worked in different game reserves around southern Africa and moving of place um, you know often regularly that when you change of place and you drink the water even though it's clean drinking tap water there's obviously different bacteria and things at, at different locations and I often found that I would, you know, especially initially when you change of place, um, you get a bad belly as my stomach starts to adjust to the change in bacteria. So you can often find that. And, and we also need the time to adapt and to adjust to, you know, the different things in the water of different places. 
So it's not different with the animals. They get used to it in the regions where they do survive. Um, and uh, they're adapted to, to also being able to um, eliminate those, the, the, the harmful bacteria that is really a problem for them to drink uh, muddy, stagnant water. So the wildebeest joined the zebra up here. Looks like the zebra now are moving off. The wildebeest just grazing as they move through the bush here. Couple of calves with them as well. Small little horns starting to emerge. So Sandy Franklin 69 was asking how do you deal with your waste without attracting animals into camp? Now I'm going to get to the answer to that Sandy Franklin, but I think we're going to change the place and let's head back to Old Donio.
We've got a couple more Masai Giraffe. Not sure if they're the same ones. Three of them. Might be different ones. Who knows? But uh, anyway, to answer your question, Sandy Franklin, about the waste in camp, bush camps and, and so on that we had, we would, you know, you don't want to have your waste lying around very long. Um, and that goes with, you know, the sort of kitchen waste. Um, so you've got to firstly contain it. Um, and we sort of made, you, you know, with, with the bin area needs to be um, away from the kitchen, firstly. And secondly, to contain it properly, because we had, you know, hyenas, jackals and all sorts coming into camp at night. So it wasn't only the likes of snakes that we were worried about and bringing the rats in. There was also, you know, a potential risk for the staff to, to have waste attracting these animals. So... You, you know, you put your waste area away from your living areas and your cooking area, etc. And you also contain it properly. So we built a, a sort of structure with a fence around it and whatnot that we could, um, you know, and close top as well. So we, we could, you know, make it hyena proof. Uh, that was the biggest thing. And once they get into the, the waste, you know, they'll make a mess as well. So, and then the second thing was to not let it accumulate and to do regular trips to get the waste out completely. Um, so that was the thing. It was a real management around waste, um, is where, where you, you know, when you're out in these camps, uh, is, is a, you know, one of the biggest issues and, and things that you need to think about um, in the management of the camps. Um, and uh, that's obviously what I also used to train with the guides um, in terms of, you know, the placement of these areas and what you do with it, etc. There must be a real plan around it. And, and every place will have a different plan, but the basis remains the same. You don't have your waste in the kitchen area and you have it contained and it must be taken out regularly. Um, in other words, away. Um, to disposal sites of whichever uh, that's going to be, if there's recycling or whatever, you know, different places. South Africa is terrible for recycling, um, generally. Uh, and even, um, you know, when there's a lot of recycling that um, is said to be done, but very often you find that you separate all your stuff um, and it all just goes into the same tip anyway. So, and then it goes into landfills. Um, some places have better systems than others. And some actually do some recycling um, and others just claim to do others don't even bother claiming um, but i've seen this across the board real problem with recycling and i would say generally in southern africa we really need to up our game um, and, and and get better solutions for you know across across the board for recycling but anyway that was just a little bit of a uh, uh, not so great note, but uh, we are heading towards the end of the show. I hope you've all enjoyed it, um, and I hope it's been meaningful, and um, that uh, it's been a lovely Easter Sunday. And I hope you enjoy the rest of it. Don't go anywhere. There's lots of action coming your way with the Sunset Safari later on. Um, and thanks to you, all the viewers. Thanks to the wildlife for being the stars of the show, and of course to the Wilder team for making it all happen. It's been wonderful. I've enjoyed myself. And I will see you in a little while. I won't be back for some time. Uh, I've got some other things to do. But uh, other wonderful naturalists that will be taking over. So, what does the bush hold in store for us in the next day? That's it from me for now, folks. Enjoy. Bush greetings. Cheers. Good afternoon to everybody and uh, happy Easter. Yes, and I'm hoping that you are having a wonderful Easter Sunday with family and friends.